Well, hello. I've been given some more time. Let's hope that uh, let's hope we can use it wisely. So, welcome everybody. This is ASP.NET Dead Core Beyond HTTP. Is everybody in the right place? Now is your chance. If you need to get out, if you start in the middle, I'm very very sorry. It's going to be difficult. So, my name is Glenn Condren. I am a program manager on the .NET team, where I work mostly on server-side stuff, so not Blazor. You'll see Blazor later if you want to go and, watch, go and watch Ryan's talk. But everything else, you know, some amount of involvement in a lot of that, especially if it's related to microservices or cloud-native applications or any of that type of stuff. Okay? So that's me. If you want to follow me on Twitter, go for it. And so I'm going to start today with discussing some application architectures and the way that we have been building applications for a while now. Right? I'm going to start with something like this. I hope most of you have probably built something like this. Maybe it was the first thing that you built. The world was a glorious place. Everything was simple. It was easy. The world, everything was great. Right? You wrote a web application, you talked to the database, you got some data out, yes, everything was good. No JavaScript, no JavaScript sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. And then, uh, this was great, right? It was good. And then, you need, when you needed, needed more, more people started to use your server, just buy a bigger server. Seems fine. And then, we started to move into this world of like this, where we said, well, that bigger server is starting to get real expensive. Um, we need more servers. Okay, well, now you need a load balancer. Well, let's try and get the static content off of the website. Let's go use a CDN. Well, now that I've, now that I've scaled my application out to multiple servers, I've got to worry about session state. I've got to put it in a database. Suddenly, the world's not so glorious and nice anymore, and you wished the world was somewhat like it was back when you were building your glorious monolithic application with you know, your, your nicely, well, lovingly handcrafted data access layer and business logic, and everything was great once again. So then we got to here pretty quickly. Then the cloud started to happen. And we started to look at building things like this. This is basically a web queue worker where, oh, OK, so now when the thing comes into the front end, I'm going to put a message on a message queue, and something else is going to take the thing off the message queue. It's going to put it in the database, and then it's going to update a cache, and then the thing's going to hit the cache, and man. I can't fit, I can't, my printer doesn't fit my architecture diagram anymore, I can't put it on the wall, I'm not even really sure what's going on anymore. But it's cloud scale. And so, then, we, as the .NET team and me, started to look at diagrams like this, because people would come to us and say, this is what we're building, or they would come to us and say, we need to build something like this, because web scale, web scale has to be like this. And we said, well, that's cool, I don't know if we really have anything for these black bits. Like, what is the template that you go file new in, in Visual Studio to make that background worker, that thing that takes the message off the message queue and updates the database? Is there something for that? How, what is the .NET way of doing that? How do I file new it? And then some other people started talking to us about this. And you thought the last one was bad. So now we've got, OK, not only do we have that same um, that same front end with load balancers and CDNs, and now we've got an API gateway. We've split all of our logic up into 100,000 million services. They've all got four lines of code in them. They're glorious. I could deploy them all on their own. Everything is great. And now I have to talk between them. How do I do that? And then what we don't really show here is also behind this, if we, go, if we went further to the right, there's probably more message queue stuff back there as well. And so it's even more like this plus the previous one is actually the complexity of this diagram. And if you were to see a diagram of like Netflix's application architecture, for example, it might look something like this. And we're like, wow, this is a far cry from the three boxes and two lines and a nice data access layer I had back when I started my programming journey. How the hell did I get here? Right? And well, we got here because the economics of the cloud changed the cheapest way to build applications. It changed the dynamics of where you want compute to run. 
and the global audiences started to mean that suddenly any application that you built would have lots of, potentially lots of people using it, or you would have very spiky traffic. Like, the, the nature of the industry has changed over time, and these architectures are falling out as part of that. So, similarly to the previous one, when we started to look at this, we were like, well, what, what is this, what about this black box? This is another piece that we don't really have a thing for. This was in the early, early parts of the ASP.NET Core and .NET Core that we were having these discussions. We were talking, you know, potentially as far back as the DNX era when I was working on those things, if anybody has been using it for that long, um, pre-10. And then um, this slowly evolved into, so we kept having these conversations and it slowly evolved into a plan or how we thought about how people should use .NET Core and could .NET use .NET Core to build these types of applications. And it wasn't just a HTTP thing. Any, it turned out that what, what these few slides have shown is that anybody in reality building an ASP.NET Core application in the modern cloud environment is not just doing HTTP. They're not just building a web app and putting it on a server. That's not what you do anymore. And so if we're building a solution to help you build solutions, then we need to do more. And so, entering the generic host, which is a great name, generic host, because it's generic and it's a host, I guess. <laughs> so, now, this is what it looks like. Has anybody used, if anybody's used iHosted services in ASP.NET Core today, um, then if this is kind of a way to run those things independent of web. So if you think about those black boxes we saw earlier, you had workers, you had, um, you had like gRPC services, you had a bunch of things in there. But just because you're writing a message queue, a worker that takes a message off a message queue and puts it somewhere, doesn't mean you don't want logging and config and health checks and dependency injection. You still want all that. You want all that stuff that you've got in your ASP.NET Core like web app, you just don't want web, because it's not web. That's what this gives you. And so, at the core of it, you have generic host, which is basically a way it stitches together the builder pattern. So in your program CS, which I'll show you in a second, you go like new host builder, you go use startup in your ASP.NET Core application today. That's the builder pattern. This gives you that, lets you use it without, without any web dependencies. And all that it does when you call run is it finds anything in DI that implements the interface I hosted service and it calls start on it. And then when it's going to stop, it'll go call stop. And now, then you have a place to write code. And you can layer experiences onto that. You can think of this generic host as the bottommost part of your ASP.NET Core application today. And you could think of the web host as an implementation of one of those hosted services that runs inside the generic host. And so then you could also think of some message queue library or message pump thing. Uh, if you look at the new service bus, SD, uh, service bus the new um, web jobs SDK, it is built on this. So you use a generic host and then you add the web jobs SDK and then you get web jobs. Right? If you go and create a Xamarin Forms application today, you can create a new host builder, add all of your Xamarin Forms to DI, and use what most people think of as the ASP.NET Core config logging and DI system in your Xamarin Forms application because it's just .NET. And .NET works everywhere. So most of these things are not .NET standard libraries and they run all over the place. So you want some DI in Xamarin Forms? Go for it. You want logging config in Xamarin Forms? Great. You want to use HTTP Client Factory to call the back end of your, your back end app from your mobile application? Go for it. This is the sort of stuff that this enables. It enables consistency at the fundamental of the app model across any .NET app, I guess any .NET app type. And we're slowly making progress towards making that be a thing, making it more and more the default. So you see these things appearing more and more. So let's, that's been a long time since I've shown any, any Visual Studio. So let's, let's remedy that, shall we? Let's open up Visual Studio and create a new project. Now, Hunter showed you Windows services, workers as a Windows service, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to make a worker. We're going to go make a new, unfortunately, at the moment, it's in ASP.NET Core web application. I've just spent a long time telling you that it's got nothing to do with web. Unfortunately, that's where it is in Visual Studio still. Sorry about that. My microphone is like dropping. So we're going to create this worker. Worker, it's a better name. 
Then, in here, create select worker service. Now you can enable Docker support, which gives you a container. You could then publish this to Azure Container Instances if you want to, is a reasonable place to put these sorts of things, um, or to anywhere that runs containers, really. And then my resolution is making it real difficult to hit create. So I'm just going to press enter and really hope that the right button had the right focus. <laughs> um, so now what this gives you zoom, over here is those noises are mandatory, by the way, if anybody's going to use Zoom anywhere, remind them. They have to go whoop, zoom. That's the way it works. <laughs> okay. So program.cs. You have a program.cs, and in here you have a builder. This is the builder pattern we talked about. And we call this method called add hosted service, which adds a worker to your app. And then we call run on it. So this is a console app, a .NET Core console application. You add this worker to class to your program. You click run, and this method gets called, this execute async. Now, earlier on, you may say, you told me we went and called start and stop on these things. There's no start method there. You lied to me, sir. And well, <laughs> I kind of did. This background service type is an implementation of an iHosted service. So it has the start and stop, and it gives you just a single method where you can just write whatever code you want. I'm flipping around pretty quick. Sorry about that. Um, it gives you a single place where you can just write your code and loop forever. And in here, do whatever you want. We also have talked about a timer-based one and a few other different types of base classes we would put in there. Right now, we just have iHosted service and background service. Right? So if you're writing a thing that you want to run forever, do some work at various intervals or all the time or whenever a thing appears or maybe you're using the Azure Service Bus SDK and whenever, whenever a message goes on a message queue, you get an event, you can do that in here. Right? And this would be the type, this would be the template that we want you to use to do that. Um, you saw Scott earlier who installed it as a Windows service. You could also put it in a container, run it on Kubernetes, run it as an Azure container instance. Um, there's a guy from uh, Red Hat right now, he happens to work for Red Hat, who is doing, contributing systemd support um, because we weren't going to be able to fit it in and we wanted to and he volunteered to do the work for us. Um, so that'll be, you'll be able to do the same thing where he said, where you saw use Windows service, you'll be able to put use systemd, deploy it to just a normal Linux server and have system, and then we will do the work to notify systemd about how, how these things work. Um, Cool, and so that's that. Now it also has a couple of things that are interesting. Um, it has its own SDK, which is interesting. It's a little bit different to web. So what this means is because we really wanted to leave out all of the web, if you want to make something, if you want to make something like this that actually does HTTP, you probably don't want the worker SDK. You want to switch to web in here because you're going to, if you're going to use web, so you want to switch to web. Then you want to go change the builder bit to put the builder in. But everything is because you're going to do some HTTP. But everything else, because this is the underpinning of the world, just because you use the web, anything you can do in here, you can do in a web app. So that stuff that you saw about deploying as a Windows server, deploying to an ACI instance, deploying to systemd, that all is true of ASP.NET Core because it's true for this, and this is the base of ASP.NET Core. Does that make sense? So really all this is is a template to show you how to mix up the stuff that is there and use it without any of your web dependencies. But nothing here is unique to this app type or to this template. You can, you can use this stuff everywhere. Because .NET is .NET and .NET should work everywhere. Seems like a reasonable catch cry. Does that make sense? Cool. Hope you like it. I spent a lot of time trying to get us to work it, to use it, try it out. So there's a few things also that you will have seen here that are kind of considered ASP.NET-isms, but aren't. Um, user secrets is one. So user secrets is where you could put some config just in your local user profile to keep it out of GitHub accidentally, um, and things like that. Right? And you'll see file nesting for app settings.json will work in here, even though it doesn't. This sort of file nesting, this doesn't really work in like default console apps and such. It works in web apps, and it works in the worker app, and that's because we have an SDK in here which turns it on. So we need this worker, we need this SDK to be able to enable Visual Studio features that you would expect, basically. Okay? Uh, an SDK, by the way, is just a couple of XML files on disk. It's not actually anything fancy in any way, shape, or form. It's kind of in embarrassingly how what they are. There's, if you go look inside your .NET install directory, there's an SDKs directory, and it has some MS build. That's it. OK, and they automatically get imported. So let's continue this discussion then of a thing called Project Bedrock. 
So we just showed you, I talked about that builder pattern being the root of the world. You have a builder, you can add hosted services to it, you can call start, you can call stop, we have background services. That forms the foundation of ASP.NET Core. Well, the very next, if that's the base, the very next click stop of a web application then is where you start accepting connections and then doing stuff with it. So if you're familiar with Kestrel, with the web server that is built into ASP.NET Core, it is responsible for ex managing connections, taking a connection from outside. PA does the, does the networking stuff it needs to do, takes that and hands it off to a thread pool thread like as soon as possible for HTTP, for, for parsing of HTTP, right? Originally, we built that whole thing just like that very first diagram that we saw as basically a monolith that does the things I just described. It was a server for HTTP. Project Bedrock is making that, those parts of our stack, that statement I just made, not be true. As with all things, it just gets more complicated and then we try and make it simpler at the top. So Project Bedrock decouples a lot of the implementation details of the, un the underlying parts of ASP.NET Core such that you end up with something approaching a connection server. You have an independent piece of code that can handle connections and you could reuse in different plays. You have different transports that can then sit on top of the connections. And then you have a different protocols that can sit on top of different transports. And you have different application frameworks that can sit on top of different protocols. Right? So decoupling a lot of those under underlying pieces. Now, this doesn't matter much to you people, probably, because you don't care about this stuff, right? You care that it works. You care that someone can open up a browser and they can get some HTML, or you care that you can make a HTTP request or a TCP request or whatever, and it just works. Do a good job. Come on. I don't want to care about like whatever that Rio slash Magma thing is. It doesn't matter. And, but why this is interesting and important is it enables us to do some stuff that I think is cool. So remember that, well, that, that bedrock kind of analogy of decoupling underpinnings and remember the catch cry of .NET is .NET and the things that work in one place should work in as many places as we can whilst we talk about SignalR. Okay, here's our diagrams from earlier. We have our like microservice -y thing, we have our like WebQ worker thing. They're probably all part of the same solution. One's probably running on a different cloud to the other one because why not? Um, and then... People might want to do, say, let's say you want to do something like this. Let's say I'm going to throw some SignalR in, because cool, because it's cool. I've heard it's cool. And what you're going to use SignalR for here in this example is it becomes the backplane of all the status events. So all these different components in your system are all doing work. As they do work, they're just going to push stuff onto SignalR. It doesn't matter if anything's around to see it. It's kind of lossy. And then you're going to have some dashboards over here just displaying statuses and messages as they go past. Or maybe you've got a front end that shows some stuff, but it's OK. If they lose some messages, you just hit F5 and it's fine. Right? Things like that. Right? Let's say you want to do that. Well, that's cool. But like we just finished saying that my worker over here is not HTTP. So if it's not HTTP, what am I doing? Like, how do I talk to, what am I, am I going to introduce the client part of that just to talk to SignalR? Um, what do I want to do here? Like, how, what do I want this technology to be? It doesn't have to be HTTP. None of the things that are actually talking to it are already HTTP right now. Well, um, what I'm going to show you is TCP SignalR. And so I'm going to show you a demo, and then we'll come back to this previous slide. Remind me to talk back, because my slides are apparently in the wrong order. So this is what we're going to show. This is not ready, not ready for you guys to use just yet, OK? All right. I could see he was thinking about it. So what we're going to do here is I have this single line via TCP directory here, and I have a server folder. So .NET run, OK? So don't, this is an app. We'll look through the code in a minute. But just recognize I'm starting my app, and it says HTTP. Just ignore that. It's fine. Then I'm going to say .NET run. I said it's not ready. <laughs> um, .NET run TCP. OK? So now what I've connected to, see, this says .NET TCP. It's fine. What I've done here is I have this console application connecting to that backend server. And whenever I type something in here, it's going to get sent via TCP to, through SignalR 
to any other client that connects. So if I go over to here, here's another, here's another command window. If I run .NET run, TC, run TCP, now you see, look, I've joined. And I can say, hi, I'm great. Trust me. I don't. All right? It's great. OK, so let's do some proof. This is Wireshark. If any of you haven't used Wireshark before. And what I'm doing is filtering for localhost and TCP port 9000. And what we're able to do here is watch all of the network traffic going between all of these little things that I've got running over here. Right? So I can cancel. Ignore the exception. Told you it wasn't ready. <laughs> Run again. So what we'll see, look, there's an exception. What we'll see here is, oh look, there's a sin, there's a sin act. Like here's a lot of here's some more stuff you probably don't care about, but here's my client connecting. And if I were to go over here and say like, hello, like that, then you'll see the network like communicating backwards and forwards. But then you'll see this thing. Look, look at that. It's TCP. It says hello. It's amazing. So all I'm really showing you here is proof that even though it said HTTP, I'm doing TCP, I'm connecting. How did I do this? Right? My SignalR code, there's also some other interesting things in the protocol here. You can see SignalR telling, for example, you can see SignalR, you should be able to see here, SignalR negotiating just after connection, saying we're going to use the JSON protocol for this. And that's why you see these JSON objects in my like, networking traffic. And so how did I do this? Well. Let's look at my, this one. Let's look at my chat hub. My chat hub code looks like every other chat hub that's ever been implemented before. It's just SignalR. So where's the magic? And the answer to that is the like bedrock thing that we just finished talking about. Because we do a bunch of decoupling, SignalR is built on top of these pieces. The fact that you can replace change, interchange kind of transports and such under the covers means you, get, you can get features like being able to do SignalR over other transports and other protocols. Does that make sense? One of the things we can do here then is, this is not directly related to Bedrock, but then we can do stuff like change this server. Let's go over to my server. Um, this exception is fine. And then, um, and then we can cancel this one too. Oh no, cancel this one too. Um, apparently killing the server before the client's a bad idea. And then add message pack. And then in my client app, which is uh, in here, which is, this is far more complicated, but it doesn't really matter. Like it's not, um, I'm doing this for the sake of demoing, and this isn't what you would actually probably write. I'm going to add message pack to both ends, right? And then if I come back over here, oh, look, this one's, this one's still going too. If I go over here and I .NET run my server again, .NET run server, let's restart my Wireshark. And I don't really want to save me saying hello a bunch. Uh, then come back to my client, rerun it, All right? And then, so now it's started. Same thing, talking over NetCP. Hello, like that. And then come back here, look at Wireshark. Well, now I have my, my connection negotiation happening. Look, message pack, protocol message pack. Now, if I come down to the big one of these, there's my hello, look. Now, you might not remember before, but previously when we looked at this, this had JSON. Now it's not. Now it's a more, more efficient kind of le using, less, using less bytes, sending less characters across the network because I went and added two lines of code to my project saying do a message pack. Right? And going over TCP because of the bedrocky stuff we just talked about. Right? So .NET is .NET. <laughs> Everything can run everywhere, right? We can start making all of, we can start making these kinds of these kinds of interesting choices and replacing these kind of pieces because we're building building kind of a well factored stack under the covers, we can start enabling these sorts of things, which you maybe do care about, unlike the like bedrocky like protocol y stuff. The fact that you can switch between these different transports, that starts to become interesting. Maybe I have a case where I want some TCP here, and maybe I have a case where I want it to be HTTP over here or whatever. Right? Um, the vast majority of people who are using WCF 
for anything in the past were doing just like TCP in, inside the firewall communications, for example, right? Because it seemed like more a good idea. Ah, seemed more efficient. I'm not sure what just happened, but I have like I think I sat on my uh, sat on the cable and it like destroyed everything. So let's see. Hopefully you guys can still hear me, unless somebody unless somebody comes up and like rescues me. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Let's uh, endeavor to persevere or something. Now, uh, where was I at? Cancel. Oh, there's no exception. Look. Oh, there was over here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, control shift F5. Yeah. Okay, so what have we done in SignalR recently? So you have some SignalR, you can do some TCP. We have this interesting like networking thing we've been doing. We have, uh, so we started to do streaming. We have client server streaming support. Uh, we've done some long polling support in a Java client, which is interesting. Um, automatic reconnection, I have a demo of. If we get to it at the end, I will show you, but I'm not sure I'm going to, and I want to leave enough time for you people to ask questions. I've been told by every single staff member here that they would really like me to stop early enough for you guys to ask questions, so I'll try my best to do that. Um, Azure Signal R service. Um, with, with WebSockets proxy has been happening. So if you're not familiar with the Azure SignalR service, it's a pretty cool way to start scaling out your, um, your, your SignalR. Um, and then, yeah, we've been, and then we've been doing some work on tooling for provisioning and publishing. So if you haven't checked out SignalR, you know, and you're interested, you should, you should give it a look. So let's talk about more, uh, let's, let's keep, let's keep failing or people can't hear me, I'll keep talking and we'll see how it goes. But uh, apparently someone tried to come to my rescue and I wouldn't let them. So gRPC, uh, or I think it's pronounced Gruppica, right, Unai? That's, that's the right way, yeah, he's saying yeah. I think that's the right way to say it, Gruppica, definitely. So we looked at this diagram earlier. We had uh, this black box with an RPC call. So gRPC at its heart is a binary protocol. It's binary. So you can't really observe it. But it does a lot of the same stuff that you would do for, say, a web API or HTTP. So why do you care? Why should we introduce another thing? Why shouldn't that black line just be web API with HTTP and JSON? Why not? Um, HTTP is great. for It's a text-based protocol. It's easy to understand. It's loose coupling. Everybody, every language in the world has a JSON library, right? Right? Maybe. Sure, JavaScript, that's all JavaScript is, right, is a JSON library. So implementations in every language, rich tooling for testing, inspection, modification, right? Like, you got, you, it's, it's, it's everywhere, and you cannot escape it. So it's ubiquitous. It exists in all of the world. So for HTTP does, and, and JSON does. Where it's not so great is... All I've got is two machines talking to each other. That's all that ever happens, is one machine talks to another machine. So why does the readability of the payload matter? Or streaming, if you want to stream stuff backwards and forwards. We have support for that in SignalR um, as well. So we'll talk about why, that matter, why that's interesting in a minute. And textual protocols can be a little bit chatty and inefficient. So theoretically, right, you take and, so I'll say this as well, the vast majority of people who are building web APIs today, it seems, on the, given the way the people that I've talked to, don't really do REST. Because REST just seems hard, and it seems like a great way to take what was one HTTP request and turn it into 500 HTTP requests. And as such, lots of people have HTTP APIs that say get all customers, and it just gets all customers. That sounds a lot like a just remote procedure call, and <laughs> not so much like, a, like a just using HTTP. As, as the state of the blah, 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 blah stuff that happens in REST. So if you really just want to write a method on a server and you want to call it from over there, maybe, maybe you don't care about a bunch of that stuff. And maybe you do care about a bunch of the stuff that gRPC does or some RPC protocol does. So what our gRPC gives you is it is contract-based. 
So if you like contracts, if you like being able to say, I want to define what every method looks like and what all the payloads for all the methods are going to look like, and then they're going to be implemented, that's what you do with gRPC. It is the only way to use it. So one of the things, for example, if you're going to write an Azure service, one of the things that happens, an API on Azure, is there is a board of people who decide what your API is going to look like, and then you go implement it. Right? So if you're in that type of world, then maybe gRPC is interesting. Um, it is HTTP2 only. Um, HTTP is kind of the de facto for REST or JSON. You can do HTTP2, but it is, it is the only way to do gRPC. It uses protobuf. So this is one of the big differences, which is protobuf is very, very close to as efficient as you can do a binary serialization over the wire. Right? It may, I want to say there is a couple of things that the guy who did protobuf implemented just after protobuf that maybe, maybe there's a slight bit of inefficiency there, but in general it's probably as close as you can get. Um, and it does streaming. It does streaming by default. It doesn't have browser support because if you want browsers, do JSON. Right? Um, but it doesn't need it because it's, it's, and it's code gen based, so you generate all of the stuff from the proto files. So it is, its sweet spot is, I want to have machine A talk to machine B to just get me all the data or something like that. I want to write that method, have it work. Don't care about anybody seeing the, net, seeing the thing. It's not a browser talking to it. I want it to be efficient, right? Taking the JSON, like a big JSON payload, and then, serial, and then sending it over the network seems inefficient when I can do like a super compressed like binary format that's basically as close to the wire protocol as possible. So that is basically the sweet spot of gRPC. And with uh, where there's overlap between SignalR and gRPC, like in streaming support, we basically view that distinction as important, that distinction of no browser support. Whereas gRPC SignalR is optimized for this scenario where you have a browser or you have a web app and you're trying to push updates to it in real time, and you maybe want to do streaming there, and gRPC is more of that machine-to-machine, back-end, server-to-server type communication. There is some movement in the gRPC community at large where they are um, trying to do kind of outside the firewall gRPC. The difficult part here is, so if you want to, some people already do this with OpenAPI, but if you want to take your gRPC service and have random other people build a client for that service, you need to give them your proto definition files. That you need a way to give them to them. Then they're going to generate some code for their stack of choice using that proto file, right? And then they're going to connect to you, and it's going to be over TCP, right? over, over HTTP2. Alternatively, you can just put a JSON API up on the internet and let people figure it out. And that happens a lot too. And you don't, you don't need to, and you aren't, if you publish that JSON API, and you could put an open API document out with it so that people could use that to try and discover more, but you're not reliant, if you're using HTTP and JSON, you're not reliant on the other person having a good gRPC stack and tooling experience in their ecosystem of choice. Because you don't, everybody has a pretty good HTTP JSON story Otherwise, they're irrelevant at this point, I would think, right? So HTTP and JSON, the way that, yeah, I think that's everything to think about, right? Like, if you're good with having the other thing be able to take a proto file, generate the code, and then talk to you, and have it be binary, and have it not be, not be like, readable by people, maybe gRPC is a reasonable fit, right? And so we primarily will say server to server seems like an obvious place where that's true. But it's not limited to that by any technical means. It just kind of becomes awkward once you start doing outside the firewall, I'm going to make all my data available by this gRPC thing. That's not to say people aren't going to do it. And it's not to say that gRPC might not become that in the future, but we'll see. That's where it sits today. So doesn't gRPC already work on C Sharp? Before, like, what are we doing? Why am I here talking about it? And the answer to that is, yeah, kind of does. Google has a C Sharp library. And it's built like this. This is a diagram from their thing about the various, from their um, site, about how various languages work. And you'll notice in the, the first orange line, gRPC C surface and C slash C++ core. 
What that means is that all of these languages, well, I guess C++ is just using it, but all these languages are basically wrapping and p-invoking into this native C library which does all the heavy lifting of doing a gRPC, right? So we, did, we were doing some benchmarking, some performance work, and this is what we found. That black line in the middle, the line that's in the middle on its own, in perf, so higher up you are, the more performance you have in this line, in this diagram. The thing in the middle that's on, it own, on its own is C++. Everything underneath it are all the libraries that invoke into the native, lab, into the native C and C++ library. Everything above it are languages that have their own native gRPC implementation, like the written in Go or written in Java. It's Go and Java are the two top ones. So what we see when we started to do this test and plot this stuff is everybody who wrote their own gRPC stuff server natively in the language of their choice got significant performance benefits over everybody who pre-invoked into the native library. That seemed interesting to us. And we don't know why that is, but yeah, that's it. So for those of you who can't necessarily make out of it or anybody who's kind of has difficulty with colors, basically Python, Ruby, C Sharp, um, PHP are all down the bottom. Um, C Sharp and Ruby are the, se are the like second from the bottom and Python and PHP and stuff are the very bottom. The one in the middle is C and C++ and the two at the top are Go and Java. Right, so Go and Java are much faster than everybody else in gRPC today. Make sense? Interestingly, as we spun up this whole effort, we found out HTTP and JSON are significantly faster than gRPC today on C Sharp because we've done so much work optimizing HTTP and JSON and none optimizing gRPC. Right? So we'll get a lot more, we'll, get a lot, we'll, get, we'll go a lot more into the, as we dive deep into trying to make this a really fast, really performant thing that you can use for all of your stuff. Theoretically, because of all the reasons I talked about earlier, this could get really fast. Right now, it's just not. And why not? There's no good reason for that. We should make it be that. And that's part of the reason what we're doing. The other piece of part of the thing was, how I said earlier, if you want to consume a gRPC service, you need to be doing it in a technology stack that has a really good gRPC tooling story. It's one thing that we flatter, we like to say that we're pretty good at, over, gotten pretty good at over the years, is making good tooling stories for things. And so that'll be a part of what we want to do as well making it easy to create clients for gRPC APIs. So what does it look like to make a, to do a gRPC? Uh, you make a proto file. This is a proto file. You say, this is the version of it I'm going to use. My package is called greet. I have a service called greeter. It has two methods basically on it. Say hello and say hellos. Um, and they take, they each take a thing called hello request and they return a hello reply. And the bottom, the difference here is the bottom one is streaming. That's how you would say, I want to stream results to you instead of just giving you one. Right? Make sense? Seem okay? Cool. So lots of nods. Well, then you define the types, hello request. That comes from a second proto file or, or in the same proto file, but a different fragment, which says, this is hello request. It has a string called name. This is hello reply. It has a string message. Right? And you have to define the order in them for some reason that nobody has yet been able to explain to my satisfaction, but that's just the way it is. Um, it's a protocol, what are you going to do? It's the way it is. So, you get one of these, or you craft one of these, you make one. Then, you add a NuGet packages to your server project that is going to run this. And I'll show this demo in a sec, but I'm going to talk about it first so that you understand. Um, you create this proto file, you add some NuGet packages to your .NET Core project, and one of those packages on build, when you control shift B or when you do a build of your project, will generate a server for this service with abstract methods for say hello and say hellos where you do the thing to return the data. And it'll accept a strong type of hello request and you'll go hello request dot message, right? Then you give that proto file to somebody else who's going to have be a client of you, and you, they generate a client for that same proto file. Then they create an instance of that client, and they just go client dot say hello, and it returns a hello request type, and they get it. And that's how the gRPC flow works. Does that roughly make sense? Yep. yep. Cool. All right, let's do a thing. Let's try and avoid destroying my uh, ability to speak this time while I sit down and do a thing. Okay, we're going to open a new Visual Studio, 
create a new project, take you through this, this flow. New web app, next. Let's call this, what are we calling this? Server, server, server. Because if you say it three times, it means you really mean it. It's really the server. And then I'm going to pick gRPC. And then I'm going to press Enter and hope that the right one's again, because I still can't see the button at the bottom of the screen. And awesome. So now I have this server, server, server. And I'm going to regret calling it that before the end of this demo. And it has an item group here and a particular element called protobuf. So part of the work we've done is kind of made this proto... Wah. Wah. <laughs> OK. You... Uh, I didn't forget to close Teams. Uh, so we have this protobuf element, which is saying, for this proto file, generate me a server, because I'm in my server project. You'll have this exact same element in your client, with client, where it says server, to generate the server, the client code. And we have a, 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 a few packages here, these, these three, right? Then we can come over here. We can say, add new project. ASP.NET Core Web Application. I'm going to call this, you might have guessed what I'm going to do here. <laughs> and then I'm going to make a web application. And HTTPS seems fine. Click Create. OK, so now this is a Razor Pages app. Um, you could do the same for like server-side Blazor. You might have trouble with client-side Blazor, because I assume it talking gRPC will probably be problematic from the browser to the server. So now we need some packages. So I am going to, I somehow lost my taskbar. So I'm going to come over here to this one that I prepared earlier and copy and paste the package references, because that's the way that you do this. And shook. this one, client, client, client. Mm, mm, mm. Cool. So we get some packages. So specifically what I'm showing you here is we need the protobuf package. We need the tools package. It does the MS build stuff. And this is actually new in the latest preview, which is effectively HTTP client factory for gRPC. Uh, did somebody say woohoo for HTTP client factory? I hope so, because I appreciate it. Um, the the, that's, that's what that package is for, because that's how we're going to consume this thing. Okay? So now I need a proto file. So I'm going to go over here. Oh, let's make me a directory, because like, I don't want to like, put it in the root of the project like an animal. We are proto. Right? And then I'm going to drag this guy up here. Now, I only noticed, I don't want that. What is this, Visual Studio? One of the things that I, and again, um, one of the things I noticed, which is super interesting, is when I drag inside Visual Studio, it adds this thing here. I don't really know why, but I'm going to change this to client. Uh, it did that because I dragged. If you're just adding the file manually, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, wouldn't happen. So I change this to client, and then I control shift B. Okay, so now let me look at the server, 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 and the client. So on my, when I did file new, I got this. It is greeter service. It implements the greeter base. It implements the say hello method we saw from our proto file earlier. And then it just returns hello, whatever the name is that I asked for, right? Like a super, super easy. So where is greeter.greeter base? Um, that is the thing that gets generated for you. So if we open up the, if we go open this in um, solution exp in file explorer, if we look at the bin, what? Well, not that. If we look at the ob, sorry in debug, in here, we have, a, we have this stuff generated in obj, right? So there is no type in your server, server, server project called greeter.greeter base. There is a C-sharp file that gets generated in the obj directory on build and then is included in the project's compilation so that you can implement it, so that when you build your app, you get it, but you don't have the code files checked into source control because you don't want to check in all that generated code for no reason. If you do want to, you can generate them into the project for some reason, but you typically don't, right? Does that make sense? So that's where that stuff goes. If you want to look at it, you can still, I believe, yeah, you can F5 to it and like look at it and stuff. It's not special. It's not magic. It's just a bunch of C-sharp that got generated. It all looks really terrible, because that's what generated code looks like. I'm pretty sure it's a rule of the universe that that's the way it has to look. Um, so then we go back up to our client, client, client project. 
it has now this protobuf client generation. So it has in its project directory, it has in its object a different set of generated code, which in, in here as well, the greet and greet gRPC. And so what it generates is a greeter client. So now in our startup CS, we're going to come over here and we're going to say services.addgrpc client, and it's called greeter client, is the type that gets generated. Um, and it's in, I believe, Google. I believe it's called greeter client. Let me, let me make sure that I have the correct, the correct name from my project that I prepared earlier. Bloop. Yeah, greet a client. So why are you being difficult for me, Visual Studio? And then, loop, loop, loop. And control D. I know I'm missing a using, and what I'm really trying to do is get Visual Studio to tell me that I'm missing a using, and then control dot my way to glory, like I'm like a real person. <laughs> but it really doesn't want to let me do that. So instead, I guess I'll go like copy and paste the using statement from over here, and hope that everything like builds when I when I uh, control shift B everything. Okay. And apparently not because what am I missing? What am I missing? I don't know why. Well, I don't have any time, so instead of like debugging exactly why I'm missing a thing, what is happening here is I believe um, it generated the server code and it hasn't regenerated the client's code for some reason. And so I'm going to ignore that for the moment and switch over to our, uh, to our prepared earlier demo and saying in startup CS, you add the gRPC client, you agree to client, you tell it the URI that you're going to connect to, then uh, in your page up here, you can at inject the greeter client, just the type, just the client for the thing, right? Now, under the covers, what is happening here is we're generating this um, client code. It accepts an instance of HTTP client. Basically, this is basically using HTTP client to talk to, to, to do gRPC, but it is taking care of managing the HTTP client lifecycle for you, just like you would get in a HTTP client factory type deal. Right? Because regardless of how any of you have been using HTTP client in the past, you're probably doing it wrong. You can ask me about why that is if you would like at the end, and I can tell you. Um, so, and then we can just say hello, and I can say hello, hello, uh, server, server, server. Right? And then I'm pretty sure if I F5 this, what happens here, if I had more time, I would open up Wireshark and we would see the completely unreadable protobuf, um, protobuf uh, binary like technology, but what's happening here now is I can boot my server, it pops the web browser, web browser opens up, and then it does says hello, we're server, server, server. And so millions of dollars of computer science research went into me being able to say hello, server, server, server. And some cool things to note is I can just like await this call in Razor, which is ridiculously cool, and you have no idea how complicated to make work. But I don't care, because it just does. So that's the gRPC demo. Um, Takeaway, key takeaways, the world's getting complicated. .NET works everywhere. <laughs> Generic host is great. And think about where you might need to use gRPC in different places versus SignalR and those sorts of things. Hopefully, I made a bunch of that clear. Um, feel free now, I've been told. I started early and I finished with one minute and 30 seconds left. So theoretically, you have like five minutes now to ask questions, probably six minutes and 20 seconds, because I have one minute and 20 minutes seconds left. Okay, and I'm told there's going to be microphones. So if you have a question, feel free to ask me. I was going to try and make Hunter come out and answer questions too. If he can hear me, maybe he'll come out, but he's not, Pro probably won't. Thank you. I'm also glad you all came here instead of Caesar's talk. I'm going to have to tell him that later. Yeah, is there a question? I can't see anything, so. Hi, sir. 
Thank you very much. Uh, just one question. Um, what exactly are the benefits using gRPC um, instead of uh, VCF? Instead of WCF? Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, what are the benefits of using, say, a gRPC instead of WCF? So there are some benchmarks that have started to appear showing at least naive versions of a WCF TCP service and a gRPC TCP service where gRPC is more performant than WCF today, even given all the stuff I just said about us doing no work for gRPC yet. So maybe it will be a lot faster. Um, also, WCF server does not exist on .NET Core officially. There is some open source projects that we've talked about in the past that have some things about it. You can come talk to me about it afterwards at the end. So there is no WCF RPC server mechanism on .NET Core. You can use the client on .NET Core, but not the server. Um, and WCF is probably the most complicated way possible to do a simple RPC call with a binary for protocol. If that makes sense. But if you want all the other stuff that WCF does, it's great. It's just that most people don't need it. Thank you, whoever asked that. I can't see where you are, but thanks. Um. Well, uh, why are you using HTTP client wrong? Okay, so if, who many, how many of you, so if you create, ah, I, I probably have this demo on my machine, but I'm not gonna go off script. If you create a HTTP client over and over and over again, like every time you need to talk to a HTTP endpoint, it creates an OS level connection and they take at least two minutes to be removed. So if you create and dispose HTTP clients in, say, a tight loop, you run out of sockets on the server and you can't make any more outgoing HTTP calls. So don't dispose of HTTP client frequently, otherwise that happens, right? So if you're not doing that, what are you doing? Well, you're gonna make a static HTTP client, use the same one everywhere. That's great, except now you never get any DNS refreshes for it, so if any DNS stuff changes, you don't know. So if you're doing either of those two things, you're doing it wrong, which are the only two things that you can really do, reasonably. So there is, in .NET Framework, there's a thing called Service Point Manager you can use to resolve a bunch of this. In one of the later versions of .NET Core, there is a property on HTTP client you can set, which will just periodically recycle the underlying connection that has the OS resource. Or you could use HTTP client factory in um, .NET Core. So if you use HTTP client factory or you make just a single HTTP client, use it everywhere and set the property that times out the underlying connection periodically, that's the only real correct way to use HTTP client in a server application. But they're both fairly new, most people don't know about it, which means most people are probably doing it wrong in some way, they just happen to have not been bitten by it yet. Make sense? Excellent. Um, I have a demo, if you just go make a, do a for loop and you make a new HTTP client, make a request, then dispose of it, and you run that lots of times, everything will just stop working eventually on your machine. And if you go run netstat, you'll see just hundreds and hundreds of ports being used until eventually they run out. Basically what will happen is if you use more ports that are then on the server than there are available, in within two minutes, that's when this breaks, and it breaks hard, like everything dies. And you don't really know that that's gonna happen until you hit this scenario where you suddenly need to make so many outgoing connections. So it's one of those things that you might be doing wrong, but it doesn't actually hit you in practice until you get like a really large amount of load on your server. And then everything falls apart, and you go, ah. Oh. Um, I did a talk about a bunch of these types of things at, um, at Dev Intersections last week. If you want more of those sorts of tips and stuff about thread pool starvation and things, feel free to come talk to me about it. Um, we can talk more. We can talk about thread pools and threads and timers and timer leaks and all those sorts of great things that you're probably doing wrong. Put timeouts on your regexes too. Cool, yeah, there's a question over there. I can see a hand. He's the only person I can see in the whole audience. There's the one putting his hand up, it's great. Uh, uh, when, if you want to make uh, use security on the gRPC, so, so if I understand correctly, underneath there is HTTP, so can you use the same security that you use today? Yeah, you can use, like, you can use client cert, like, auth, like uh, authentication, and you can use a bunch of the same HTTP authentication mechanisms, yeah. I think I say that somewhere. 
I guess not. <laughs> I'm sure I had a thing that said client off and stuff like that, but yeah, it's fundamentally HTTP, so you can do a bunch of the same mechanisms. Frequently, because of that server 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 to server mechanisms, um, what we commonly, what we mostly like, what I've mostly been interested in seeing is that cert like story where you have like a cert on both servers, and then everyone can talk if they have the cert, and everything is great. Right? That type of setup. Thanks. Cool. Yep, yeah, one over here, hesitating, but I saw you. I saw you start. It's too late now. Hello. Uh, can you talk a bit about uh, the streaming implementation? The streaming implementation? Can I talk about it? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know where my limits are, and that's it. <laughs> um, so you mean in gRPC? Yes. Streaming in gRPC? Yes. Yeah, unfortunately not, I'm sorry. Um, the, mostly because I don't know, because I haven't spent enough any time working with it yet. It's only, the guys have only just started to, to make it work, and I haven't, I haven't spent enough time digging deep into it yet. Um, there are, however, some demos available. If you come find me, I can give you a link to some source code that does show some streaming, and I believe it is from a community stand-up. So if you go look at some of the community stand-ups that have Saurabh from my team on it, he demos it and he talks about it a bit, and we have some code and stuff available. I just can't talk about it very much. Oh, I'm sorry. I had to be one. Everyone was going to keep asking questions until I didn't know the answers. That's the way it works. <laughs> Is there more? Yeah, no? He's just stretching. He's faking everybody out. He was just like, ah! <laughs> Nope. Seems like it. Okay, thank you, everybody.